Welcome to the Leeds Edutainment Podcast, featuring in-depth interviews with people in hip-hop culture, based out of New England. Thanks for uh, making time. Yeah, likewise, man. No problem. Cool. Cool. I'd like to welcome everybody to the Leeds Edutainment Podcast. We've got a very special guest, rapper Ill Bill. How are you, brother? I'm chilling. How you doing, bro? Good, good. I see I noticed you got a Metallica Wasp thing behind, uh, poster behind you. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a poster from like '83. It's, it's, wow. it's I, I, never, I actually didn't get to go to that show. I was like 11 at that time, but yeah, that, yeah. That's, like a, that's like one of I think one of Metallica's first shows in in, in New York in the east on the East Coast. I remember seeing Wasp as a kid on in the in the uh, wild. Remember Wild Tops. Remember the, sh- the Wild Top store in the mall? I don't know if you had them out there in New York, but you could just Wild basically... Tops? Nah, I never heard of that. What, so basically, you like... go, go in there and get any band picture ironed on your shirt. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Yeah, I never heard of that. That's crazy, though. That sounds, so, that sounds dope. Yeah, so Wasp that was there. And it was all the controversy behind Wasp. Like, what does it stand for? We are Satan's people. We are sexual perverts or both. What? <laughs> What, what did it stand for? I remember we are se- we are sex sexual perverts. I remember yeah. people saying that. Yeah, hell the reason, yeah. The reason I bring it up, you 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 listened to metal first, right? Like metal was before rap, correct? Nah, nah. No? I listened to rap first, but okay. but like I mean, really, I listened to just music. Like, I always been a, a music fan since I was really, really 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 young. Like I always gave a shit about music before anybody, any of my friends really tuned into it like they didn't really care right yeah it was like music was always like background shit you know what i mean but not not for me i was always like psyched on music making my little tapes taping the radio top 40 all that you know videos whatever video shows were on back in the day like you know friday night videos like stuff like that mainstream stuff before cable before right. mtv and all that so like yeah just top 40 regular disco my mom used to play a lot of disco music in the house like a lot of Donna Summer and all that type of stuff. Village people, you know what I mean? Like, all that, you know, like very, you know, dance music, Studio 54 type music, you know? Right. So that's what I grew up on. And, and, and then, and then I, you know, once I started developing my own taste, like buying albums and buy, actually buying my own music, once I was like 12, 13, I started buying like rap albums and metal albums and stuff like that. But Originally, it was really hip hop first because I didn't even, you know, I didn't only metal. I mean, I, I don't consider Kiss metal. Kiss is more like rock and roll. And I, I liked Kiss when I was a little kid, but I loved Kiss because of the makeup and the image more than the music. Like, I love the music too. I grew to like the music, but that wasn't what hooked me on Kiss. It was the image and, you know, just how, how addict they look. You know, they just look crazy. So that, yeah. that hooked me in. But, but yeah, so like, Metal came came a little bit later, but like hip hop for sure, you know, just Houdini, you know, Nucleus Jam on it. Like, I, you know, I, I, I can name just all those songs that were out before Run DMC even came out. Like just the first, you know, Sugar Hill Gang, you know, Rest of the Light, all of that, you know, The Message. That was all the, the first hip hop that I heard because that's the first stuff that pretty much got pressed to records. And, so I was up on it right from the beginning. Plus, I'm from New York City. I'm from Brooklyn. So that's the epicenter of hip-hop. You know what I mean? Even more so than any kind of rock music or anything like that. In fact, once I started getting into the neighborhood I grew up in was predominantly black neighborhood. And um, I think, like, just the kids that, that I grew up with were like, the fuck are you listening to? What is this, you know, you to that devil shit? They thought Van Halen was devil music. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. So a lot, of pe- a lot of people did. Yeah, back then. You know what I mean. So yeah, like, everything talking, metal was everything metal was devil. I'm talking like 1983, 84. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. but um, but yeah. So metal came later. But like, I, I was definitely a lot more serious with with uh with metal as far as like starting a band and really get to the studio and doing stuff. That that was where I, I got my start in the studio and working on music. And being an artist myself was with my band, which was like, we started in 86, we broke up by like 1990. So we, we, we did it for like four years. 
looking back on it now, it's like it was really just like a quick blip on the radar. You know what I mean? But it seemed like a lifetime back then. You know what I mean? Right. So uh, your family history, we know that Necro is your brother, right? Did yeah. You, what, what? <laughs> and Uncle Howie's your uncle. Yes. How How is that growing up? I want to know that family dynamic. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta understand that family dynamic. Well, I mean, my, you know, my uncle—that's my mother's brother, and uh, yeah. you know, Howie, and um, well, he's more like an older brother, right? For, to me, you know what I mean? Uh, and uh, so the dynamic with him was just always, just always looked up. He, you know, he's like 15, 15, 20 years older than 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 me. You know what I mean? So right, he's. More than older, you know, a little bit older than older. But Howie was like, Howie's like a forever young kind of dude. He was a kind of dude. He was, you know, just very. He's like a party animal kind of, kind of, kind of dude. And I'd say like, maybe if I say he's immature, it would be seem like a diss. But that's a more of like a compliment in a sense because he was just, you know, even though he was like 15 years younger than me, he's like, he's he was he was like an older brother to me. You know what right. I mean? That's what um, and yeah, he was he was a very wild, wild in the streets type of dude, and um, not so much something that I, I you know I look up to now. That's not really what enamors me, and and as and what I what I I love about him so much now. But as a kid, I looked up to that, you know. And uh, right. uh, and Necro's my younger brother; he's uh, four years younger than me. So that's just the dynamic is baby bro. That's my little brother. You know what I mean? I mean, that's, that's what it is. Right. That's how it was growing up. You know what I mean? And that's why he raps. He raps because I rap. You know what I mean? Like, you know, he was in my band too. He plays guitar like a motherfucker. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I can see like that, Eddie, but I didn't know he that. Play, he plays like Eddie Van Halen, bro. He's crazy. Rest he in peace. Busy. Yeah, yeah. So, it was, was the original Dimeka hip hop at Rec Men Necro making the beats and you rapping? Was that the whole how it kind of started in the beginning as far nah. as taking it serious? Nah, nah. You, well, you, as far as the hip hop stuff, um, nah, Necro wasn't making beats at first. At first, actually, um, the way he started making beats is I bought a, 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 an Insonic EPS yep. with the intention of making beats. Right. And really, I got sidetracked. I wasn't really on it. I got into making beats kind of a little bit more later. I was more inspired by my brother, actually, later on to really dive in. But uh, at that point in the beginning, I, I was the one that was really trying to make beats. But um, he just took the keyboard. I, 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 he was collecting dust. I was more into rhymes and just writing and not really concentrating on the beats. And he, he pretty much took the, took the reins and he, he, he went with it. But uh, initially, uh, I was just doing demos. It was me just doing demos. I would go to the studio. I'd travel to Jamaica, Queens. You know, this is when my my, my brother was like 14. You know what I mean? So he wasn't really going with me. I was, I was like 17, 18, taking a train to Jersey, taking like two buses, two trains, and just doing dolo missions. Just me. I would work with different engineers. I, I would listen to radio shows like Hank Love and DNA and, and like find out where to go to, to record you know, demos and whatnot, because they'd have, they'd advertise different studios and whatnot. So there's a studio in Jamaica, Queens called Little Rascal Studio that a lot of MCs, name your favorite MC from Brooklyn or Queens, they probably fucked with Little Rascals. This dude named Dr. Death. He was the, he was the engineer. People that used to listen to Hank Love and DNA every week he used to have a commercial they used to run. So right. we're talking like, this is like 1990, 91. You know what I mean? So... That's how, that's that's when I started doing rap demos and 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 those those demos within a, like a year of doing them by like ninety two we were sending them in to catch and Bob and um it was me and Gore-Tex really doing a lot of the demos you know he wasn't really rhyming that much at that point but me and him right. were the ones making the beats at that time right. you know what I mean and Gore is like a year younger than me so it's a four year difference between me and Necro and a, a year and a half difference between me and Gore so we all together and kind of came up listening to metal, listening to hip hop. And that's why we have similar influences. We talk about a lot of similar, similar topics and chamber. It's like, you know, there's, there's a reason why we sound the way we do. It's, it's you know what I mean? It's, kind of, it's right. me, Gore, and my brother kind of, we kind of have like a sound. 
in that way. We, we do we do it our own way. You know, each one of us have our own take on it, but you could tell there's a there's a tree and we're all branches from that tree. Right. You know what I mean? So so when does you you meet search in this scenario and non nonfiction comes to play? Uh search uh well nonfiction started me and search started uh nonfiction in ninety five. I met search probably Obviously, I knew Search was. I was a third base fan. I, you right. know, I was up on. You know, I, I knew. I knew about Search putting on Nas and all that. You know, and uh, which was really Elmatic came out like Elmatic came out like a year before nonfiction form. So in the time frame of that, it's kind of crazy. You know what I mean? Because I was real psyched to hook up with Search, knowing that he had just put right. on Nas. I took it as a yeah. you know, you know, Nas. He's working with OC. And I said that's a crazy compliment that he wanted to fuck with me because I, I I already knew, you know, what OC and, and Nas were doing and what they were capable of, what their potential and what their what their, you know, how dope they were just at that point. You know what I mean? So I was like, oh word, he wants to he wants to work with me. Okay, cool. You know what I mean, that was like that put a battery in my back. That was that was like a, a a good validation for me at that time, a great validation. Like, it, it, like made me feel like, yo, I could really do this. I could probably get a record deal. I could probably really do this. You know what I mean? So yeah, that was like 95 when we clicked up. I met him probably like in 94 through Riz. I'm pretty sure Riz made the introduction. Riz used to DJ for him. Riz and, and Eclipse actually were both DJing for Search. He had a two a two DJ situation, kind of like main source, you know, and, and Riz and, and Eclipse were his DJs. So interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Two DJs, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When he went solo after uh yeah. after after third base, yeah. He had when he did Arsenio, Riz and, and, and Eclipse were with were with him. Right. They were they were the DJs. So, so yeah, so actually um uh, Riz Riz introduced me. And Riz and Riz is like a legend in Canarsie, like my, my, my neighborhood in, in Brooklyn. Riz yeah. is like probably like four or five years older than me. And like he was always the man in Canarsie. He was he was that dude, you know, and, and uh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he he looked out, you know, in in, in a lot of different ways. Over the years. that's the homie. You know? Right. So nonfiction forms. Talk to me about the definition of a goon, because I feel like you don't get enough credit for starting the goons, <laughs> the goon trend, because you really you guys originally the you're the original goons of hip hop. Yeah, we were the ones that were throwing that word around before anybody else really like in, yeah on, on some hip hop. In fact, before <laughs> um, it's crazy because before before nonfiction, we would go up to radio shows. In fact, Riz's radio show Riz had a show called uh, Damn Man. Now I'm tripping. I, I can't. I forgot the name of the show, but it was it was Riz and, and Wild Man Steve. They had a show right. in Long Island, and uh, it's dope. And uh, it was on every week, and that was one of the shows that we had did. I did it at that time, you know, just going up freestyling, uh, dropping verses and whatnot. And uh, w one of the times that we went up, we actually introduced ourselves as if the group, as if we were a group. It was like right. me, my brother, Gore, and we we called ourselves the Goon, like literally. <laughs> that was our name for like a week. We can We had mad different names, different crew names, different over the years. It, it flipped and bounced, different things. In fact, nonfiction. We had fiction like long before me and Search put it together. So when me and Search uh, you know, were trying to come up with a name, I had nonfiction in my back pocket. I was like, "Yo, what do you yeah. think of this?" And he's like, "Oh, that was dope." Yeah. But the goons, though. <laughs> yeah, man. What is the What is the definition of being a goon? <laughs> A goon is, you know, I mean, shit, I don't know. It, it could be a lot of different things. It's just a, a, it's a, a someone. Who, I mean, Uncle Howie's a goon. You know what I mean? We used to, uh -huh. we used to call ourselves Uncle Howie goons, too. That was another <laughs> little thing. But like, yeah, like you know, I don't know. I, I, you know, in some ways, a goon could be someone who's thugged out, someone who might, you know, stab you. You know what I mean? <laughs> Take your chain. You know, a goon could be somebody who's just super talented. You know what I mean? Like, yo, he's a goon on the basketball court. You know what I mean? Like, like someone who's just someone who's aggressive, someone who's who's just super funny, commit, could have a great sense of humor. Yo, that dude's a fucking goon, bro. He's hilarious. I mean, it's a lot. You know how it goes, bro. You know, it's just slang. Yeah. So it's multi know? multi meaning. It's multifaceted. It's multi meaning. Yeah. So, you non know, fixing this together, you guys start putting out singles. 
what was the first single that really made some noise for you guys? I mean, the first single we dropped, I mean, the first single we actually put out was uh, uh, Legacy No Tomorrow. Yep, uh, No Tomorrow. Which was, I mean, to put it in context, that came out in 96. It was the, yeah. it was the, it was Searchlight Fat Beats distribution. It was the second vinyl uh, record that Fat Beats manufactured in their, in their, you know, entire mythology of putting out records. First record they ever put out was the X Men record, the DJ record. But it's actually the first record. I joke a lot because I still work with Fat Beats, and I, I tell people <laughs> I'm the LL Cool J of Fat Beats because I'm literally <laughs> the first. Even though, you know, they say you know Def Jam a lot of times they say he's the first rapper. He's the first rapper. LL, I guess he's the first rapper to put out an album on Def Jam. Even though they put out Tila Rock and they put out some singles, but but anyway, yeah, I, I I was the first rapper I think, or at least nonfiction was the first rappers to come out. Yeah. Fat Beats, yeah, it's like Fat Beats Search, like, and that, that single sold like twenty thousand copies, bro. And at, at, at that time, it was a big deal. It was. It's a very big I mean? deal. It was, it was, it, you know, it was, it was, it was crazy. So yeah, I mean, out just from from the beginning, it was, it was, it was popping. I remember because I started, you know, I started hearing about you guys twelve inches later, like ninety nine, two thousand, and I started working in Boston. And I remember the company I worked for, Metro Concepts, he'd be like, yo. Nonfiction is touring off singles. They don't even have an album. I mean, that, that, nah, I mean that <laughs> single got us our record. I like, got us our, our first record deal. We got signed to but Geffen you, off of that. Off of that. But the years. album wasn't out though. I'm sure, well, right? Like, nah, wasn't the out. Al nah, dude, we, didn't, we didn't have an album. Nah, That's we, what I'm saying. So you guys were yeah, touring. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> hell yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what, what we did was we, we started we started touring, really touring, like like in '98. Like right. when I started Uncle Howie Records, like 25 years ago, it was 98. And it was around the time of the I Shot Reagan single. So that yep. was probably like our, our fifth single at that point. Right. So now if you figure we put two, three songs on every album, on every single. So by 98, even though we we dropped five, six singles, we'd already dropped the album's worth of material. Even though we hadn't dropped an actual debut album, if you put all those songs onto a CD, we could have dropped an album. At right. that time, we weren't trying to. We were trying to put an album out on Geffen Records. That was the plan. So we signed a Geffen in '96, and we were off Geffen by the end, by the mid, like mid '98. Like that's why we actually we were on records because Geffen they didn't want to put it out. They didn't. They they should have never signed us. They didn't understand what they were signing. They thought right. they were signing like I don't know, bro. Like they thought they were signing like something else bro they didn't think they were signing a group that was going to talk about shooting the president and shit like that you know what i mean so they were like yeah. you can put this you can put this out you can put this out on 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 vinyl yourself and let's see how it does <laughs> and we were like cool you know i mean we sold twenty five thousand copies of that one like in the first month like that's what i'm saying you're 12 a different era. Selling. yeah Bob was selling like like crazy you guys you guys in the singles before your album official album came out it was very impressive <laughs> very oh, impressive 12 it, era. yeah i mean i you know that that was just that was the era you have to also understand at that time it wasn't like how everybody drops digital singles you know yeah. they drop a digital single every week you know what yeah, i mean no. it was an event to drop a, a 12 inch right you know sometimes you drop a 12 inch maybe once a year you know what i mean it's equivalent to dropping an album so right. i mean you know, for back and and uh, you know, I think the fact that people used to always want to get more than one copy, two copies, you know, to DJ help, you know what yeah. I mean. But but yeah, back then it was no big deal for singles to sell fifteen, twenty thousand copies. When when Primo did the beat or Pete Rock did the beat, you'd sell forty, fifty copies. Like it was like that. It was guaranteed. So what did that feel like at that time, making Future Is Now and working with all those legendary producers? I mean, at that time, it must have been surreal at some it point. Felt it felt great. Like it, it was like, whenever you know, when you plan something in your mind and, and then you make it happen, you bring it to reality, that's what it was. It was just a fantasy that we were like, yo, why don't we just try to make this shit happen? And, and we did. You know, and it, was just, it was just kind of connecting some dots. It wasn't that big a deal because... We knew these dudes already. We knew them from Fat Beats because they used to be in Fat Beats every week. These these dudes right. buying records, you know, and and hanging out. 
You know what I mean? It was like Fat Beats was people that didn't get to experience Fat Beats will never understand what it was and what, what it represented, how big it was and how important it was. And somebody needs to write a book or do a documentary. I might have to write a book or something about Fat Beats. Well, you should, since you're, the, you said you're the LL Cool J of Fat Beats, you, you need to... Yes, sir. <laughs> you need to take thousand that. Percent, thousand you percent. Need to take... At least, at least help, help put it together. You, yeah, but actually, could... Fat, Fat Beats got a documentary coming up. So that, that, oh, that's going to be... That'd be dope. Yeah. I want to see that. Yeah, hell yeah. So the album comes out, nonfiction comes out, you know, the, the first out, the debut album, and then, you know, the green, the green out, the green CD, but that was like, crush my memory. That was... That's not an was, album. People yeah, say that, that was like people, a, we only had one album. I'm gonna tell you exactly right. what it was. Right. That it was that older we joints. Did, no, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna break it down. That right. that right that what what happened was after we when 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 we were doing all these shows, you know, from '98 to like 2002, around the time we put out the future is now. All that time we we would we would film all that shit. You know, we filmed mad footage like probably like 300 hours, 400 hours worth of footage, hundreds of tapes. Right. And um, around the time we put out The Future Is Now, we decided, because at that time it was it was really popping to put out uh, DVDs. DVDs yep. were hot at that time. So we were like, yeah, yeah, you know what? We have math footage. Let's start working on it now. It took us like two years. Started working on it in like 2002. By 2004, we dropped it. And um, before we put out The Future Is Now, there was a, a a point in time between the Geffen deal and and us dropping it ourselves, where we were going to put out the album on Matador Records, which is a, a indie rock label from New York City. Everyone and right. uh, bef before, while we were working on the album during the the, the Matador deal, we dropped a promo tape that uh, is kind of legendary to nonfiction fans because there's only 500 of them made. So anybody that has one of those tapes. Uh, at least the original ones, because we reissued them later. But um, that's a, that's a different story. But but yeah, at that time we dropped five hundred of these promo tapes. We gave them away for free, and it was all songs that we never had released as album as an album. All the singles we put out up until the future is now on a mixtape that Eclipse put together, and we called it the Green Tape. Right. And uh, that dropped probably in like two thousand. So what we did was we kind of made the 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 DVD an extension of the green tape like a like kind of a tribute to the green tape because of the rarity of it and and it was really popular with with fans people people like to collect it so we were like you know what we're going to call uh this new project the green DVD and so what we did was we included a CD that's like over hours worth of music that's almost like this like the tape it even has stuff on on the CD that wasn't on the tape, like crazy or more rare demos, other freestyles right. and stuff. But yeah. probably about 80% of the green CD was the green tape. Right. So that's where okay. it came from. So, gotcha. but, but really it started with the DVD. It's more or less a DVD release. And the, 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 the CD is kind of like a bonus. Kind of like a bonus. Yeah. Like a bonus. Gotcha. Right. So that, was, I, I thought... that was the plan. That was the plan anyway at the time. Sorry. <laughs> so, no, no. So that, so at that point that comes out, you no more then you go solo right like you get going solo with the well, future no 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 we already doing solo stuff before that but uh, oh really yeah, yeah we 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 put out solo albums on necro's label psychological same year we dropped uh uh the green cd dvd in 2004 okay. all right so it's parallel solo album. yeah okay. that same time, the three members of nonfiction dropped solo albums Gotcha. That now now it's coming back to me. So that was yeah. the what's wrong with what's wrong with Bill uh, album, correct? Yes, sir. That's when I meet you for the first time. We do a show around that time at the Middle East. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you remember you, Cunique, and I think that was the first night you might have met Slain because Slain opened up that night, or at least met him in. Nah, that's not the night I met him. Actually, I met him. Damn, not, I wanted credit for I that. Didn't, I didn't meet him. <laughs> I didn't meet him that night, but uh, I met him not that long after that, though. Like like with year after that. Talk about the relationship with Slane and forming La Coca Nostra, because I like to talk about that, because that's important for history. Slane, you know, Slane was, he was, he was like the new artist on the scene at the time that La Coca Nostra was forming. Because La, La Coca Nostra was obviously uh, a combination of House of Pain, Slane, 
and myself. So right. it was kind of like three generations of hip hop. Slain being the newer generation, me kind of being uh, middle. what was happening like right at that time. <laughs> and then obviously House of Pain being a legendary platinum selling group. You know what I mean? Uh, they were, you know, iconic. So it was like crazy to kind of bring those three worlds at three different kind of time periods together into one group. I, I, I don't, you know, we didn't really know how it was, how it was going to gel, but like, obviously the albums, two more albums than nonfiction did. So there's definitely a, a ill chemistry, you know, and, and me and Slane have an incredible chemistry and that's beyond being artists. That's just my, my boy. That's family. That's my brother. You know what I mean? And uh, we become real tight and really good friends over the years. You know what I mean? And if anything, we better friends and, and we closer today than we were before. Sometimes people grow up over, over, over the, the, the length of time. And that hasn't happened with me and Slain. You know, like we, we still talk all the time and we're about to start working on some more Lakota music and get, get some, some more Lakota music out there because it's been a minute. You know what I mean? But yeah, man, it's a pleasure working with Slain. There's, 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 there's really, you know, only a that I really love working with. You know what I mean? Like really, really like love working with. Like it don't even feel like we work it. You know what I mean? And right. Slain's one of them. Was the first song Fuck Tony Montana? Was that the first song you guys yeah. recorded? Yeah, that's the first that's the yeah, story yeah, yeah. I got. Yeah, yeah. The, the story on that was uh, that song was recorded uh, at a session uh, at Lethal's house. And from what I understand, that was the first time uh, the three members of House of Pain were together in a studio for in over like 10 years. That, that day. And that's right. the day we, we recorded Fuck Tony. You know, right. at least we, we started it. You know, me and, <laughs> me, and, me and Eric, me and Everlast laid yeah. our verses to that. Yeah, and that's the story actually, I heard. Yeah, that was another track we did that day too, but I can't remember which one it was. It was, it was we started working on two joints and that, and that was one of them. Did you find it difficult to carry on Lacoca once Everlast left the group? Or, you know, was it tougher? Was it become a different thing to you? Or was it just business as usual? I mean, we didn't, we, nah, it, it, it was definitely different. You know, it, it, the dynamic changes when a member of, of the group leaves, he's also, the, out of the three MCs, he's one of the three MCs. So it definitely right. changed the dynamic. But I will say, though, it was kind of, uh, out of left field we didn't it wasn't something we knew that was going to happen when it happened right. and like we were already working on masters of the dark arts when yep. eric decided not to you know to to continue with lacoca so like um it, you know what i mean we kind of want more or less what are we supposed to do just like dead the album like you know what i mean we just kept working you know and, and yeah. it is what it is you know what i mean but Eric could have very well been on Masters of the Dark Arts because he it was still, you know, some of those songs we we had discussions about with Eric. You know what I mean? That right. songs that he's not on now. You know what I mean? So, yeah. So I mean, and then obviously when shit is happening, it's not you don't really reflect on. It. It's not something that I'm really going to think about like too much at that time. Looking back on it now, yeah, of course the dynamic changed. You know what I'm saying? You could hear it. I think. You know, there's a certain balance that different people bring to a situation, you know? So I think it remained balanced because there's enough members of the group still in the group to keep it balanced, but it changed. The dynamic of the group changed. The sound changed a little bit. Yeah. For sure. Well, I want to thank you for doing the first Lacoco show in Boston with me when you guys did your, when you, you and Slane did the show, your mixtape release parties, and then you brought, uh, ever last out as a surprise guest. Do you remember that night? Yeah, yeah, hell yeah. That was a beautiful thing. Man. That, that was, was early in my career, and to be part of that early on my career, that was great. That was a great show. So that thank you for making. Thank you for making that happen. Thank you for making that. Yo, happen. I mean, you know, just all these years, bro. Appreciate all all the times you know we got to work together and all that. It's yeah. dope, bro. Yeah, I mean that's that's honestly that's that's the only reason why we're even doing this podcast right now because i don't really do podcasts like that so <laughs> well, thank you yeah, i thought just, that too i was like man. You're the, yeah it's because you're the homie bro you know what i mean? appreciate so. that 
I also want to talk about Darren Lacoca. You get some major label deal offers too, a solo artist, correct? Or like yeah, before actually, it, right before it or during it? When, when did that uh, happen? Because I remember you had this big deal on the table. Right before Lacoca, I got signed. I got a solo deal with the, with Warner Brothers, yeah. which was it was uh, my boy Howie Abrams uh, had a, a a label called Perfect Game. So it was Perfect Game Warner Brothers. So that was right around the time that Lacoca came together. Right when I got I got signed. Actually, that uh, the album I recorded for that deal was the hour of reprisal which actually right. ended up not coming out through one of us right i remember that too ended up, yeah so yeah why did it did you did you not like the deal like what happened with the no, deal? the deal was great no the deal was great it had nothing to do with 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 the deal as to why the album didn't come out on warner brothers it had to do with perfect game with the label uh, uh -huh. yeah they they just parted folded. with yeah they folded and they parted with warner brothers and the thing is, um, I already had a really good, like, I had a great relationship with Howie Abrams. Actually, Howie ended up going on and, and was, to manage me for a while after that, that deal uh, didn't end up not happening. But, uh, well, I, I should have said not ha after the album didn't come out. The deal happened. But, um, yeah, uh, you know, Howie looked out. There's something called a key man clause that he put in that contract that a lot of artists don't get, but I got it because of the relationship that me and Howie had. And he took care of, of the fact that I was able to walk. So like, for example, the album cover, we got this this uh, artist, I'm a, a really big fan of Rest in Peace. His name is Larry. Uh, before he did the uh, the Owl of Reprisal album cover, the only artist he'd ever worked with or did album covers for was Slayer. He did like four album covers for Slayer. like like some of their most legendary album covers he did. And um, because I had a crazy budget through Warner, I had like a $300,000 deal. I was able to pay something for an album cover that normally I wouldn't, you know, independently, I never paid 10 grand for an album cover. You know what I'm saying? Like I was able Whoa. to pay 10 grand for this album cover. That, wow. That's the kind of budget I had. So it's like, totally. that's just a small thing that I was a win. That I was able to walk with the album because I got to walk with not just all the music I, heard, I got to walk with that album cover. You know what I'm saying? So crazy. Didn't they also? Get, I thought I heard something. They gave, got you a studio too. They got you gear. Did you mention? I mean, that? I mean, I, they gave me a lot of money. I bought a lot of shit oh, with that okay, money. See, you know so, oh, yeah, so they I gave mean, you money, yeah, buddy. <laughs> they gave me. They, they gave me. They gave me money. You know what I mean? I also got a publishing deal at that time with Warner Chapel, so that was a whole other deal. So that enabled me to make certain moves and, 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 you know, buy some equipment, amongst other things. I also remember you, and I'm not, you know, I don't want to air out too much of your business, but stop me if I'm going too far. I remember you turning down a strange music deal. Well, it's not so much, <laughs> I'm going to tell you exactly, well, <laughs> what happened you don't have to, was, you know, if, if you don't want to no, go I'm, too much, then. No, I'm, I'll, well, I'm, shout out to Strange Music. Shout out to to Tech Nine, Travis. Um, I put it like this: We never signed a, a, a an actual contract, but people thought that I was signed to Strange already because we were make we were moving like I was already signed to Strange. I was doing tours with Tech. Yep. Um, we were doing a lot of stuff, and really, I'll I'll say like I'll say it like this: If it was up to me, the deal would have happened. Uh, but certain things were changed at the last minute mm. that I, that I couldn't get with. And it, I don't know if that was a negotiation tactic or what the science was, but I just, if they would have presented me with, the, when we, when I was on tour with tech, we had the deal ironed out verbally, the deal would have remained as it was, maybe I'd still be signed to Strange Music right now. Who knows what would happen? You know what I'm saying? But the reason why I didn't sign with Strange is because the deal got switched up at the last minute. And it was Bummer. like, yeah, and it was just like, ah. Uh, that sucks. Can we do the deal that we agreed to do? Because I'm down <laughs> for do that. 
Apparently yeah. not. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, when you dropped when you dropped our appraisal, I uh, remember we did the show in Boston. You toured with Sean Price. Um, that was the album release party for that. That was a great show. That was an amazing show. Rest Thank in peace, bro. Sean Price. Yes, sir. Rest in peace. Yeah, it was a shame that he won. Yeah, that's the bro, man. Yeah, you guys were tight. You guys had a lot of music together too, from what I remember. Yeah, we we you know we didn't get to do the album that we wanted to do. We did. We we got it in. We we, we recorded a bunch of stuff together, and that's cool. You know what I mean? Wasn't there a, ru- was it there we, a rumor that he was going? He was going to get on. He was going to be in La Coca Nostra. Was <laughs> nah. I mean, nah. I mean, that was like nah. You know what it was? Uh, Sean Sean's just had out of anybody in hip hop. Even motherfuckers that claim to be comedians, nobody had a better sense of humor. Nobody was funnier than Sean. And he just would make shit up. He was being interviewed. When me and him were on tour together, he was being interviewed. Because we would do interviews all the time. Like, I would do one and he would do one at the same time, like before the show type of situation. And I think that's where that rumor started from because he... He just lied. He smoked mad weed and lied and said that that he's in Lakota. He's just... Fucking breaking the dude's balls. The, the interview was just, you know what I mean? And and yeah. then it just snowballed from there. You know what I mean? But I remember walking into the dressing room, the, the green room that night, and fucking right before the show, and Sean's just like, just in his boxes, like, hey, what's up? I was like, yo, man, sorry. Sorry to interrupt, but he, he played it cool. It was pretty funny. He just had yeah. a great sense of humor, man. He's, yeah, he's rolling with anything. He's always, he's always kidding around and, and, and like, you say something. And you think he'd be mad, mad serious? And he, he wasn't serious. He, he, he could keep a straight face. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, he could scare a lot of people too in that way too. He, that people, big guy. He was a fun, <laughs> but he, you know, it was, it, he was he, he, a lot of promoters would would not really understand his sense of humor. They would get a little shook. You know what I mean? But he'd just be playing with them. Same with that. He interview. was always, he was always cool with me, man. I never had one issue. Never ever. No, nah, that's the homie. Hard to go, great dude. Right. Rest in peace, man. Miss him. Absolutely. Um, I also want to talk about the next alliance that you have, but probably was already going on at the time with Heavy Metal Kings and Vinny Paz. Mm-hmm. How, how did that, I mean, obviously you guys rolled in the same circles, but did you expect that song to take off like it did and start a whole group when you originally made it? I mean. Nah, nah, it wasn't the plan. <laughs> that wasn't the plan, but yeah, yeah, that's, 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 uh, that's dope that, one song could spin off into a into a, a group, you know. But yeah, that's my bro. That's that's like I was saying earlier about Slain. It's the same thing with Vin. It's like there's only certain people that, you know, it's just it's a certain chemistry. You know what I mean? We, we just got it like that. I think me and him grew up listening to a lot of the same stuff. That's why we're the heavy metal kings. Right. You know, grew up listening to metal. And um yeah, that's that's just the bro. It's like if he drops an album, I'm probably gonna be on it. If I drop an album, he'll he's probably gonna be on it. You know what I mean? Like that's just how it goes. That's how we do it. Hey, did you perform on that farewell tour? Yeah, I think I saw you. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw pictures of you. Yeah, I jumped up with him in the uh, in, in Brooklyn. Yeah, that was dope. You think, he, you think it's really gonna be the last time he performs? Well, I mean, I'm, if he, listen, I hope not. But I, I mean, I think I think he's saying, I don't think he's saying he's never gonna perform a show or do shows ever again. But just no touring, but, you know. I mean, shit, we'll see, you know. And then, you know, he could always change his mind. You know? right. How many groups? How many groups do that? You know what I mean? So a lot. That's maybe, why I maybe, don't really believe it. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't believe listen, it. maybe he just needs some time off to decompress. You know what I mean, and, and and maybe he'll be back. I guess we'll, you know, we'll see. You know, never know. I want to talk about this new album, obviously, Billy. Now, you've definitely dropped a bunch of albums before this one. A couple, I think, a few from what I saw. Was that yeah, this all is my, just... This is my seventh album. This is my seventh solo album. Well, I guess I'm since uh, since the last Lacoque or the last group project, I guess I'm thinking, that you put out uh, two solo albums before this. There were shorter albums, though, right? There was. Forgive me, I don't have the list in front of my name. What was the last one called? Oh, the last solo album is uh, yeah. uh, La, La Bella Medusa. Yeah, so that was like short, right? It was like nine songs, right? No, no, it was it was like was it twelve? It was like twelve joints. Forgive me, I'm I'm off my. I don't think because oh, the question I was going to ask you was this. I mean, was, it's it's still short short compared to this album. I mean, twelve. That's songs, what I was trying to say. Like twelve I songs like... versus twenty three is 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 definitely <laughs> nah. I consciously 
it's just a reaction, bro. If everybody's going right, bro, I gotta go left, bro. I'm not. I'm tired of these thirty minute albums. I'm tired. Feel that. Not saying I'm not gonna. My next album might be thirty minutes, but at least. But this <laughs> one, I wasn't gonna do a thirty another thirty minute album, man. Fuck all that. I was like, yo. Well, the I'm, reason I bring this up is because I felt like this album felt like there's something you were building for a while. Like this was like yeah. a bunch of joints that was. This was like you were really making this the one out of the last were shorter. So that's I think so. I think I should try to make. I, I I think this album differently in a bunch of different ways, marketing wise, the way I, I promoted it, and um, it was an experiment kind of how I did it because I never I've never done it that, that that same exact way. And I actually am really happy with the results. I like how 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 it worked out. I like the way I rolled it out. I'm not going to do every project the way I did this one, but I'm not going to say I wouldn't do another project exactly how I did this one again in the future. Because, yeah. you know what I mean? It's like I, I just certain things that I did and the way I did it, I liked how, how it worked. You know what I mean? What was different about making this one besides the length? What were you – where was well, your head at? Well, you know – Part of it is just the, uh, obviously it's just the length is of the album is, is whatever that that's, right. that's, you know, that's cool, but that's just more or less just me wanting to give people something to really digest and live with. You know, it, it, if you you know, 10 songs, it's like two weeks later, it's forgotten. I feel, and I mean, Absolutely. 20 songs, maybe it's uh, four weeks later, it's forgotten, but at least, you know, <laughs> Four weeks He's got like a couple week, weeks. A couple weeks more, you know what I mean? But uh, I think just the way I did this one, like a buildup, uh, I feel like I was kind of like on, on like, uh, kind of like doing it like in a, in a full kind of way of just drop a single or two, drop the album, drop a video, done. You know what I'm saying? Rinse and repeat. And with this album, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna start dropping singles before I drop the album. Like before I even, before the, my bad. I'm gonna start dropping singles before the album's done. Yeah. I've never done that before. It's great. I've never done that before and, and, and it was really fun to do, you know? And actually, to me, I feel like I'll, it made the album better because what, I, what, what it forced me to do is Obviously, when you're singles, you're picking the cream of the crop. You're picking because it doesn't make sense to drop a song if you have five, six, seven songs recorded and you want to drop one of them to get people excited about what you're going to be dropping soon. You're not going to drop the what you perceive is the least or the or the worst of the seven. You're going to drop probably the best of the seven. Absolutely. So, I kept dropping singles that I was feeling are like some of the best songs that I had. And that forced me to make songs that were at, at, that I felt were at either as good as those songs, as good as those singles, or better than those singles. So I kept kind of raising the stakes on myself and challenging myself by releasing these singles, putting pressure on myself to, to match it. Because how are you gonna drop two, three, four singles and then when you, the album drops, is bullshit. Right. I knew I wasn't going to do that. And someone might think that I did that. You know, everybody's entitled to their opinion, but I don't think I did that. You know what I'm saying? I feel like this album, I feel like, in my opinion, a lot of these songs could be singles. You know, it's like, oh yeah, it might be two <laughs> songs and two skits, but I, I feel like it's an album full of A-sides. If you fuck with my music and you like you like what I do and you've been fucking with me for 20 years and you haven't heard this album yet, listen to it. You're probably going to like it. Never mind the friends and family on here. We got Sick Jack in, Immortal Technique, Vinny Paz, Lord Goat, Clips, Nems, OT The Real, Slain, JS1, Ransom, Ritz. Did I forget anybody? Jeez. I'll tell you, I, nah, nah, probably not. I mean, maybe. But, but <laughs> you know, I'll tell you something else that I find, I, I, I think, I find it interesting that, that I think y'all will find it interesting. Remember what I was saying about how, like, you know, I was dropping singles and I was challenging myself to try to, like, come up with something at least as good or better than what I had already dropped. And part of that is why I had two songs on the album, because he's on one of the singles that I dropped initially. Yeah. 
that's part of the reason why I got Nems on two joints because yeah. he's on one of the first singles that I dropped. And it's like, if you think about it, it's like I could have went and got somebody else to jump on that second joint that Vin got on or someone else to jump on the second joint that Nems got on. But it's like, to me, I feel it's more cohesive. It's more of a, it's, it's, it has, the album has a sound. And it's like, it ain't about having 20 different features or 30 different rappers on your album. It's not a compilation album. It's not right. a fucking movie soundtrack. It's Billy. It's my album. So right. if if I'm going to have some, somebody's going to be on the album, like two songs here, two songs here. You know what I mean? Like it's going to be somebody like Vin, who I did a full album with. I did two full albums with him. It's going to be like Nems who I've done a full group project, Gorilla Twins. Gore-Tex, he's on like three or four songs on the album. Nonfiction, this is my child, you know what I mean? So if you look at who's on the album, it makes sense. It's really not too many people that I've never worked with before. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's pretty much family. And if it's other people, the other people that are on there that I haven't worked with, is there's a reason, there's a rhyme and reason as to why they're on the album, if we go in depth. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Who did the production on this album? You know what? I'm gonna. I'm just gonna <laughs> He's like, go. I don't want to get this one wrong. <laughs> I'm gonna go song by. Uh, I'm just gonna go song by song. I'm gonna scroll it. I'm talking. Sure. While I'm talking. So, uh, I don't forget anybody. Alpha Futura, produced by Peter Punch. Hella Waits, produced by my man Furio. Uh, Jordan Threes and Ballad of Billy by Stangers. Know My Name, produced by Scam 2, also featuring Scam 2. Uh, Kanasi Koresh, Lord Goat, Prophets of Doom, Fun G. Uh, so many producers. I'm just going to name producers. Uh, uh, <laughs> Gore did like four joints on the album. Uh, oh. my, my boy Little he did the Smartin' Up joint. Yeah, uh, little uh, Stu also did Once Upon a Time in Kanasi. My boy Sunday. Did the joint with Slain OT on it, Yala Yala. Uh, uh, my man JS1. Yep. He did This Is Anger. Uh, of course, DJ Muggs. You know, that's the homie. I always try to work with Muggs as often oh. as possible. Um, you so had the he, album with him, too. <laughs> yep, yep. Hell yeah. You know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. there's a lot of that. You know what I mean? It's like people yeah. that, I've, that I've been working with for years. Um, Static Selector who I've worked with already a ton of times. This is the first time I've actually worked with him on a solo album, but um, worked with him on, on, on La Coca numerous times. Uh, uh, yeah, man, shit. See Lance, man, I don't think I'm forgetting anybody. I think we got it all in body bag then. That, that's, that's the production line. You know? The, uh, the album cover, where was that, that that you used that? That was a place in, was that Spain? Was it Spain? Oh, it's Italy. That's, Italy, that's, in the, that's like in the suburbs. Of, that's like outside of Rome. That shit's bugged out looking. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so right. we I, recently we, you guys did the tour, the the nonfiction tour, the twenty year anniversary. Um, how was it like to get on back on the road like that? Um, it was great. It was, it was the first time nonfiction is the first it's, nonfiction hadn't done any shows since twenty nineteen. So four wow. years. No, yeah. yeah. A lot four of years. And like before that, I did a couple shows with Cypress, like in October. Yeah, that th th that was like those are, those are the only shows I've done in, in since 2019. My my couple couple show run with Cypress and these nonfiction shows. So I'm looking forward to back on the road now. You know, with the Coca shows, everything, more nonfiction, more solo stuff. You know, now it's really like just starting now to get back to to normal. Yeah. So we got we got another Lacoca in the works. What else is in the works? Yeah, more more music. Just more music. I don't really want to say yeah. too much just because Fair enough. I don't know what's gonna come first or what's but I'm I'm always working on uh group projects and, and yeah. solo stuff. It never stops. There's no you know, in between putting out albums, there's all the work is being done. So I mean there's always work being done and music being made. I gotta give it to you, man. You got quite the catalog. You got quite the catalog. For, I just for, haven't really. stopped, man. It just, you know, it just keeps it keeps building up. You know, it's That's like great, try to drop an have, album a year. So at least you, you know. Do you still have the passion for writing and rapping? Like you used, like you always seem like you still have it to me. Like you still I give mean, every verse one hundred and ten percent. You know, it's 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 like anything else. It's 
you know, you have your ups and downs, you have, you know, and, and, and there's times where I get a little burnt out, but then I'll just make beats for six months, you know, like while I recharge my battery and just make beats okay. for just nice. months at a time, not write any rhymes at all. You know, when I get burnt out on rhymes, that's, that's what I'll do. You know what I mean? And, right. and, and then after that six months, I'll be so sick of making beats. I won't make beats for years. You know what I mean? And I, I just fuck with the rhymes. You know what I mean? And, and that's what it is, huh? That's Beats the process. Rhymes. That's the process. Yeah. So one other thing I gotta say, I see pictures of you lately. You seem like you lost a lot of weight. I'm not trying to get personal on you, but what was your secret? <laughs> oh, I've been secret? working on it. I mean, the secret, the secret is I had King's disease. Shout out to Nas. You know, and, and for those that, that aren't Nas fans or don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, you know, it's just overindulgence, you know, for a long time I was just and getting away with it, really. Just doing whatever the fuck I want. You know what I mean? Eating whatever the fuck I want. You know what I mean? Like partying, just indulging too much. You know? And mm. who the fuck is going to tell me no? You know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> I, right. I got, you know, if I don't tell myself no, ain't nobody going to tell me. Ain't nobody going to tell me no. So, yeah. you know, and then it's just, shit catches up with you after a while, bro. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I, I talked to the doctor and she, she wasn't looking right. You know what I mean? So I had to get shit right. So I had to check myself. So, yeah, bro. I, oh, shit. I've lost Congrats a lot of to weight. to you, man. Yeah. I've lost a lot of lose? weight. Like in, the la like in the last year and a half, I dropped over 100 pounds. You know what I mean? Wow. And I'm still working on it. So just changing the way I eat. You know what I mean? Being more active, going to the gym. And just, yo, Slain has been an inspiration to me in that, in that, in that, you know what I mean? Because, he turned it around too. Me and Slane used to be both of us used to be like double the size we are now. You know what I mean? So uh, I remember. I mean, I might be exaggerating, but it felt like it. You know what I mean? And I'm gonna tell you, me and him both. The same thing you told me. People, people be telling telling us that, and not just me. And, and I don't want to put Slane on blast, but I'm proud of him. You know what I mean? It's it's, it's just what it is. You know what I mean? You get older. We got kids. I'm trying to be it. There's no people. Look at anybody old. Anybody in their eighties. Bro, they're not fat. You know what I'm saying? Right. Fat people die young. So, unfortunately, it is. And I love food. You know what I'm saying? It is a struggle, but you know what I'm saying? It's not worth dying for. You know what I mean? That's well, good. I'm glad you uh, you got the you you're working on that. And it's, it's it is a struggle because <laughs> that's the tough thing about eating. You still have to eat. It's not like putting drugs and alcohol where you can yeah. just quit them. You still got to eat. You get old. <laughs> Your metabolism slows down, yeah. everything, you know, it's like and COVID. You know, your joints ain't that. working how they used to, you know what I mean? Like it's just, you know, ankle pain, pain you know what it is, man. You know, you, yeah. can, you know, there's two kinds of pain. You can have pain from not being healthy, or you could have pain from recovery in the gym, working hard. You know what I'm saying? I'd rather have that kind of pain. Well, You're gonna have pain regardless. So it's just a matter of choose choose your pain. Choose your pain. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bill, I want to thank you for your time. I won't to keep you any longer. Uh, I really appreciate this. And uh, this has been great, man. And all success to you. And keep doing what you're doing, man. Likewise, bro. Appreciate like it, bro. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in to the Leeds Edutainment Podcast. A very special guest, Ill Bill. Thank you, brother. Peace, bro. Thanks. Thanks, bro.